this epiphany season of our Lord to receive all the blessings we receive from his appearance and to thank and praise him for those blessings. We begin our service today by singing the opening hymn. Amen. 
Almighty God has given his son to die for you and for his sake forgives you all your sins as a called and ordained servant of Christ and by his authority I therefore forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. The Lord brought me up, me to the banquet house. And his banner over me was love. Your steadfast love, O Lord, extends to the heavens. Your faithfulness to the clouds. Your righteousness is like the mountains of God. Your judgments are like the great deep. Man and beast, you say, O Lord. How precious is your steadfast love, O God. They feast on the abundance of your house, and you give them drink from the river of your delights. For you have, for with you is the fountain of life, in your life to be seen. Glory be to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now. The Lord brought me to the banquet house, and his manner over me was love. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the free peace of the Father, for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord.
and grant us your peace throughout all our days. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be saved for the reading of the lesson. The Old Testament reading for the second Sunday after Epiphany is from Isaiah chapter 62. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not be quiet, until her righteousness goes forth as brightness and her salvation as a burning torch. The nations shall see your righteousness and all kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will give. You shall be crowned with beauty in the hand of the Lord and the royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate. But you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your sons marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Praise the Lord, all nations. Extol him, all peoples. For great is his steadfast love towards us and the faithfulness of the Lord endures forever. Ascribe to the Lord the glory to his name. Bring an offering and come into his courts. The epistle reading in the basis of our meditation for today is from 1 Corinthians chapter 12. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray by mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says, Jesus is accursed. And no one can say, Jesus is Lord, except in the Holy Spirit. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. To one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom. To another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another various kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who appropriates to each one individually as he wills. This too is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. We rise and sing the common hallelujah in verse in preparation for the reading of the Holy Gospel.
when the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does that have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw some out and take it to the master of the feast. So they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water, now become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn it, the water knew. The master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This was the first of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee, in manifesting his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the gospel of the Lord. We confess our faith in God using the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds. God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, that was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again, according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified who spoke by the prophets, and I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church, I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead, and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated that we sing the hymn of the day. <laughs>
Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father, through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Now there are varieties of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are varieties of activities, but this, it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. This is our text. December 12th of 1980, a small startup company called Apple became, be, first became a public corporation and began to offer its first shares in stock. In the business world, this is referred to as an initial public offering. There was a lot of documentation that had to be filled out to the Securities and Exchange Commission before they could do this to protect people who would invest in this company. One such document required a full disclosure of any foreseeable weaknesses or problems as the new corporation's goods or services go to the market. Here's what Steve Jobs wrote. He was one of the founders of Apple and disclosed this as a foreseeable weakness. And you have to remember this was 40 years ago. The expansion of the personal computer market will require a continued orientation effort directed at informing individuals of the means by which computers may be utilized to enhance personal efficiency and productivity. Towards this end, the company is committed to an extensive advertising and promotion effort. Now, in this day and age, when we think about that, we have to think about what this statement says. Basically what the founders of Apple Computer were saying was we're not so sure people are going to understand what this thing can do for them. We're not so sure people are going to understand and fully embrace it, the potential of a computer. We're not so sure this thing is going to go over. Now in the world of today when computers are essential in our lives, when we wear them on our wrists and strap them to our sides and carry them wherever we go, they drive our cars, they run our homes, they are practically everywhere. It seems impossible to believe that someone who is starting a computer business would have any doubts what would happen. If you look at it from the other hand, though, a mere five or six years earlier, this same group of Apple put out a computer that was really a circuit board. It was a metal box about so big that had lights on one side. It had no monitor. It had no keyboard. It had no floppy disks. It was hardwired to make the lights flash in a certain sequence. That's all it did. Job's second computer was a little device that he could hold up to a telephone and steal long distance service. It was called the blue box. Computers really weren't much in this day and age. Oh yeah, the big mainframes were. But the little boxes that you put on your desk and plugged in your TV really weren't a whole lot. In some ways, as we look at our text for today, we might think of this in the same way. This text begins, Now concerning spiritual gifts, brother, I do not want you to be uninformed. It occurs to me that through, though we frequently talk about the third person of the Trinity, the Holy Spirit, not too many of us are sure what he does. Today we use the Nicene Creed and that goes into a much larger explanation of who the Holy Spirit is because quite frankly the early church had a lot of questions about who he was. Up till that point, they'd have the Apostles' Creed, which said basically, I believe in the Holy Spirit, and left it at that. 
But as we look at this today, we want to think a little bit more about what does he really do and what does he help us achieve? And we find in St. Paul's explanation that the church is empowered by this Holy Spirit without whom we are helpless. Just how helpless you ask, we have to look no further than Martin Luther's explanation to the third article of the Apostles' Creed. I believe that I cannot by my own reason or strength believe in my Lord Jesus Christ or come to him. Put simply, that says, I believe that I can't believe. I can't do it. I can't get me to God. It won't happen unless the Holy Spirit does all the things that he does in our lives. In the sense, the Holy Spirit is, in, is essential in our Christian life as the computer has become in our, in our civilian life. He's something we cannot live without. And again in Corinthians 12, 1, it does not literally speak about spiritual gifts, but simply states that there are spiritual things. That is the work that the Spirit does in everyday life. St. Paul informs the people of Corinth that they would be amazed if they really knew all that happened when they had been baptized. They would be amazed if they understood how much that changed their life how much that water and washing put the Spirit of God in their being and connected them to other fellow Christians who were believers that the Spirit might work for them all and form a living body of Christ on this earth. For that's indeed what it is. In other places Paul talks about this how there are many many people but there is only one body. And just as there are different parts of the body that accomplish different things, it is still one body. One of the things that we find amazing even today is that it's amazing what one little thing in our body, one little hurt, one little pain will do to pretty much louse up the operation of the whole body. It's just the way things are. And so should we find it strange when we, who are individual parts of this body of Christ, don't really function that well, if any part of that body of Christ doesn't function well? To be truthful about this, what Paul, St. Paul is talking about is what spirit we're living under. Are you and I living under the power of the Spirit of God or the Spirit of me? It's amazing how often that seeks, seeps into our lives. How many times we kind of get off track, forget who we are or more specifically whose we are and go off by ourselves. Bear in mind that that makes the body of Christ that much less active and functioning. And it's not odd. We come to church on Sunday, we go home, and there's so many things that have to be done. There is laundry to do. There are meals to make. We have to go to work. We have to do many things in our lives that quite frankly distract us from who we really are. And make no mistake about it, Satan's very good at that. Satan's very good at distracting us. At getting us to forget that that part of our life is part of our whole life. When we were baptized, 
when God began working in our lives through the Holy Spirit, our daily lives changed completely. It was a different functioning. We worked about things differently. I often kind of use this as an example when we were all younger and learned to drive and finally got our license. It was that amazing thing that was a big deal for us. It was a big deal because it literally changed our lives. We could go places and do things. Yes, true, sometimes we could go places our parents would just assume we hadn't gone and do things that they probably weren't that happy that we were doing. But it was that independence, that freedom, that changed how we lived our lives. I tell you, it doesn't, uh, it doesn't take very long to figure out. Just lose your license or have it expire. Uh, which is kind of Illinois. It's kind of funny. We have the non-expiring license. I don't know if I'll ever have to renew my license again. But the thing is, go for a period when you can't drive. When you have to go get somebody else to take you somewhere. Find out how much more cumbersome your life becomes. And in some ways that's the way it should be as we are incorporated into this body of Christ. And don't get me wrong, we, we kind of put a lot of status on some of this. What we are in the body of Christ. But St. Paul makes sure that he tells us that that's not how God looks at us, at it. Every one of us has a vocation. Every one of us has been put on this earth by God to do certain things. In fact, to be honest, most of us have a handful of vocations. A pastor, a teacher, a mother, a father, a child. We have different roles we fulfill all at the same time. And how we function in our daily lives is also how we function in our Christian life. Are we good stewards? There are some parts of our vocation that seem very spiritual. That seem that they must count more before God. One of the one, of course, is evangelism. Intentionally going out to be a witness to what God has done in your life. Or church work. Or taking care of the poor. Or many other things that we do that seem to be closer to God or more God-like. But we are reminded that without the Holy Spirit, we aren't going to do anything that's God-like. It reminds me of a couple of, uh, conversations that I had with people when I first decided I was going to go into the ministry. One of the things was a lot of people would come up to me and say, well, this is wonderful. You're going to be doing God's work. Well, first of all, no. God's going to be doing God's work. Some of it he's going to be doing through me. Hopefully I won't get in his way too much. Have you ever seen Luther's chancel prayer? That's basically what it comes down to. Luther says as he's praying, as he's getting dressed in the sacristy, God, don't let me get in your way out there. Because it's very easy to do. Not only from my actions, but from how people view me. It's really interesting sometimes to see that people react to a pastor who is a, has a known sin. 
and how people look at that differently. We all knew that pastors are sinners, just like all the rest of us. But somehow it makes a difference. And you know what's really silly about that? It's like God has failed. We focus on the agent of God rather than on what God does through him. In the early church there was a, a heresy that came out after the persecutions. It was called the Dantonist heresy. And what was happened was there was a lot of time during the persecutions where pastors and even bishops denied Christ because they were, yeah, tortured. And many people believe that if they had gone to sermons preached by those pastors and bishops, if they had been baptized by them, all those things were no longer valid. Of course, the church in conference with one voice said that isn't true because in all these instances God is working. It's God that's doing this. Believe me, I've had times to thank God that that's the truth. I remember one baptism that I did that about 90% of the pronouns I used for a little girl were he. Not something you want to do. It was embarrassing. Didn't make the baptism any less valid. It's one thing that Luther always talked about when he was a monk in the Roman church that if you did a mass and you said one word wrong you had to go back and start over again because that just blew the whole thing it was worthless I'm sure that you thank God that that's not true because as many things as I say wrong we'd be here all day and we'd never get done But the point is, is that God works through us, whoever we are. And whatever task we're doing, it is God working through us to accomplish his goals. It's funny. There's a lot of vocations that don't seem so spiritual. I can think of especially when I was on the dairy farm cleaning the barn didn't seem very spiritual not one of those things I held up as an example of my service to God fixing a car a lot of times doesn't seem that spiritual I'm sure that for parents trying to convince their teenagers that 10 o'clock is long enough to play video games that they should be going to sleep probably doesn't seem very spiritual. But the point is that in all these things, it is God working through us to accomplish his goals. It is God working through us to do what he wants to do. A little while ago I said that evangelism to a lot of people seems to be a very spiritual thing. When I started my evangelism course in seminary, the first thing the prof said was, what you have to impress upon your people is when they talk about being a witness, as soon as anybody knows they're a Christian, they're a witness whether they want to be or not. The question is going to be whether they're going to be a good witness or a bad witness. And here again, it's when we really especially look for the power of the Holy Spirit to work through us, to enable us to do that. Maybe as we mature as Christians, that's how we know what is the more spiritual task. It's the one that we depend the most on God to accomplish. 
And it brings us back to this problem that St. Paul was addressing in the Corinthian church. There were some people that had spiritual gifts that they were kind of, you know, bragging on. Hey, look at me. I have the gift of wisdom. I have the gift of tongues. Paul was saying, that's not a you thing. That's not something we accomplish by ourselves, nor it is something that we should take great pride in, because it, in, in effect, destroys the ability of God to work through us. Yes, we all know the old joke about there is no I in team, but there is a me. It's not the way it works in God's world. Not the way it works in God's world unless the me is the spiritually empowered me. The one where we get to walk around in this life that God has created for us to do truly good works because it's not us doing them. It's God working through us. But mainly what St. Paul wants us to understand today is that God's gift, God's gifts work through us only as he does what he wants. I always find it amazing in the story where Jesus at the end of time is judging people and he's separating the sheep from the goats and he turks to the one group of people and tells them all these wonderful things they have done to him and then he turns to the other group and says that they haven't done any of these things. What always gets to me is the answer of both groups. Both groups literally ask, when? When did we do this? When did we do any of these things? They literally aren't knowledgeable about them. It's what happens as you are God's person. It's not something you do because it's supposed to be done. Illinois, like most states in the United States, have laws that compel parents to be good parents. Now, has any parent a good parent because there's a law that says they have to be? Not so much. Not so much. When those laws come into play, we know something has gone terribly wrong. In the similar fashion, it's not the law of God that compels us to do what God wants us to do. It's when we live in God's blessings and allow him to work through us that he in fact accomplishes his works. Strange as it seems, it's something that we all have to remember. That in fact God does his best work through us, sometimes in spite of our best efforts, and he accomplishes his, his will, whether we particularly want to cooperate or not. So like being a witness, it's a matter of being a good witness or a poor witness. When it comes to being a part of the body of Christ, it's a matter of doing it God's way or doing it my way. My way doesn't work. God is the one who accomplishes all of this. That we might live and serve together in the body of Christ and support each other and help each other to that eternal life we all look for because Jesus indeed has redeemed us and the Spirit has given us faith in those promises of God. 
Amen. And the peace of God which surpasses all human understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto eternal life. Amen. We rise and sing the offertory on page 159.
We implore you to bless every husband and wife. Do not let them provoke one another in anger and strife, but also let them live peaceably together in love and godliness. Strengthen them with your gracious help in all temptation and help them to rear their child in accordance with your will. Grant us all to walk in you, with you in purity and holiness, putting our trust in you and leading such lives on earth that the world to come, we may say, may he have everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. We continue with the liturgy of communion. The Lord be with you.
So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Take, eat, this is the true body of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, given unto death for your sins. Take, drink, this is the true blood of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, shed for you for the forgiveness of your sins. The body and blood of our Lord strengthen and preserve you steadfast in the true faith unto everlasting life. Amen.
Thank you.